The case was only a matter of rudimentary logic, easily constructed from the newspaper, but totally dissimilar from the murders in the Rue Morgue. Dissimilar in construct, dissimilar in the approach. Yes, however, there were many similarities. Yes, come in. Ah, oh, what seems to be the problem now? Nothing in the way of assassination, I hope. Oh no, nothing of that nature. The fact is, the business, the, the business is very simple. Very simple indeed. I have no doubt that we can manage it ourselves, but I thought Mr. Dupin would like to hear the details, because it is so odd, so very odd. Simple and odd. Why, yes, and not exactly. The fact is, the business has puzzled us, because this affair is so simple, yet it baffled us altogether. <laughs> Perhaps it's the very simplicity that puts you at fault. What nonsense you talk. Perhaps the case is a little too plain. Oh, good heavens, who ever heard of such an idea? A little too self-evident. Ha ha ha! Oh, Dupin, you'll be the death of me yet. And what, after all, is the matter on hand? I will tell you, but first, let me caution you that this is an affair of the greatest secrecy. I should probably lose my position if you were known I confide it to anyone. Proceed. Or not. Well then, I received personal information from a very high quarter that a document of the last importance had been purloined. This is known. The individual who purloined it is known. This is beyond doubt. He was seen to take it. It is also known that it is still in his possession. How is this known? From certain events not happening. The robber must not have employed its knowledge. Be a little more explicit. The document holds a power for that. Uh, the document that holds a certain power of a person that has that power. But he would be exposed to the thief. Who would dare? The thief is the prime minister who dares those things becoming and unbecoming a man. What do you mean? Let me demonstrate. The letter has been received in the royal room. While Madame was reading it, the entrance of His Highness interrupted her. The very person with whom she had to hide this letter. She places the envelope and thrusts it on the table. At this time, in comes the prime minister. He sees the letter, recognizes the handwriting, sees that Madame is distraught, and, and instantly fathoms her secrets. First, he converses upon public affairs with his highness, talks about affairs of state, problems of common people, then proceeds to plot a letter of his own. He pretends to read it, but thrusts it on the table next to Madame's letter. He then converses upon business with the, his highness. As he takes his leave, he takes a letter from the table, but it is Madame's letter, leaving his own insignificant letter on the table. So she knows he has it. Yes, and the power of taint has been wielded for some months, for political purposes. She needs the letter back, but because of its contents, she cannot ask for it openly. Alas, she has permitted the matter of returning the letter to me. <laughs> no more sagacious an agent could be desired or imagined. You flatter me, but this could be true. My first instinct was to make a thorough research of the minister's hotel without his knowledge. As you know, as prefect, I have paid keys to fit any chamber and cabinet business while in Paris. You would know that I searched every nook and cranny of his premises. And is it possible that the letter is not on the premises? No. The instant availability of the letter is just as equal as its possession. And may we consider the chance of it being on his person? That is entirely out of question. Yes, entirely. His person has twice been waylaid and rigidly searched under my supervision. Still, I do not quite understand. Perhaps a few detailed particulars of your search. We took the building room by room. We searched the drawers. And as you know, to a trained police agent, such a thing as a secret drawer is impossible. We searched all of the cabinets. We probed the cushions with fine, long wheels. We took off the tabletops for a letter that could be concealed in one of the legs, surrounded by cotton so that it would not be hollowed out. <laughs> we examined the buttons of every chair in the hotel. We examined the joists by the aid of the most powerful lenses for a letter that could be concealed in it. There was no shorter in any of the rooms. I suppose you checked. Among the mirrors, between the boards, the beds, the bedclothes, the carpets, the curtains. Yes, the curtains, the carpets, the floorboards beneath the carpets, and the particle of every piece of information, and the particle of every piece 
of furniture in the hotel. And did you check anywhere else around? Yes, we checked all of the grounds around the house. We checked the moss between the bricks. It was understood. And you checked among his books and papers, of course. Yes, we opened every package. We not only looked through every book, but every page of every book. Behind the wallpaper? Yes. The basements? Yes. Well, then I fear you must be making a miscalculation. The letter is not on the premises. I fear you are right there. And now, Mr. Pound, what would you advise me to do? To make a thorough research of the premises. Absolutely not. As sure as I believe the letter is not on the premises. I have no better advice to give you. are exceedingly able in their way, so far as their labors extend. So far as their labors extend? Had the letter been within range of their shirts, shorts, there would have been no doubt that these fools would have found it. However, one must think how one's opponent thinks. This is where the prefect failed. The minister had been more of an analytical mind. There would have been no doubt that the prefect would have found the letter. But the minister is not just a mathematician. He's a poet. There you are. It occurred to the Prime Minister that he needed to be too cunning for that, so he left it in plain sight. It never occurred to the prefect that he'd leave the letter in plain sight. But still, he wouldn't, or she wouldn't see it. Oh, she saw it, but she didn't know she saw it. I took on the occasion to call upon the minister. I then decided to ask him a few questions, and there I saw it in plain sight. It was on his desk. He folded the letter inside out and readdressed it. I then decided to leave behind my snuff box and took my leave. I decided to call upon the minister again to retrieve my snuff box. This time, when he wasn't looking, I grabbed the letter and replaced it with a fake one. I decided to talk to him for a little while longer, and then took my leave. Wait, but what purpose did you have in replacing the wet letter with a facsimile? Why didn't you just take the letter and go? Ah, the minister is a very desperate man, and he is never without his hotel attendance. Had I done as you suggest, I would not have made it out of that hotel lobby before his men would have nabbed me. You see, the time has come for the minister to rebuke himself. For a while now, he's had the lady in his power, but now she has him in hers. The time will come where he'll have to open that letter in front of everyone, committing his own political destruction. The minister will have to find out that it is far easier to climb the mountain than it is to descend. 